so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, read the, this 10 pages or so. It's about a 35 page long chapter or lecture. So I am only going to do uh, the first 10 pages. And the first image that appears on the facing page to the chapter title uh, is this one. So I'll share that with you. And uh, it reads uh, figure 14, the spiritualization of matter portrayed as the coronation of the Virgin Mary. The scene represents the alchemical quaternity, father, son, and Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is represented by the dove with the feminine matter as the fourth, matter as the fourth. Okay. Chapter three, Greek alchemy. Last week, we discussed the possible meaning of the handing over of the secret of alchemy by the angel Amnael to the goddess Isis. We use amplifications from ancient legends, which say, in effect, that all natural scientific knowledge uh, from mathematics to the making of women's cosmetics was taught human beings by angels or giants. None of this is to be taken literally, by the way. Okay. We also discussed the strange fact that very often at the end of a patriarchal civilization, there comes an enantiodromia. The power is handed over to a feminine figure, as for instance, when toward the end of the Egyptian civilization, the cult of Isis became predominant and Isis more and more took over the role of all other gods. There are even late Egyptian prayers in which Isis is invoked as the one who is all other gods in a feminine form. This we compared cum grano salas with a grain of salt uh, with the fact that now within the Christian civilization, at least in the Catholic part of it, the Virgin Mary has suddenly been raised to a more dominant role than hitherto. We should not forget that these mother goddesses are also connected with the concept of matter, for not only is the word itself connected with the word mother, but the whole projection of matter and the model, archety model archetypal idea at the back of the minds of natural scientists is drawn from the mother archetype. Plato, for instance, says that space is like a nurse to the whole cosmic order. Thus, space is regarded as a feminine container, a nourishing function of the mother. Since the idea of matter is always secretly connected with the mother archetype, if the Pope shifts emphasis in the Christian cult onto the Virgin Mary, this is consciously or unconsciously a blow struck against communistic materialism. It is a gesture in that it is a gesture in that sense, and, it, and an attempt to get at its materialistic aspect by placing emphasis on matter in a different form. Interest in matter, therefore, springs from a resurgence of this archetype. Uh, for example, Mother Earth in climate change. And... Uh, when she's referring to the Pope here, she's re referring to the assumption of the Virgin Mary into heaven, which was a papal bull of Pius XII, uh, where Pope Pius indicated that uh, the Virgin Mary had ascended into heaven. Reading on on page 65, when Young natural scientists choose their profession. Frequently, Mother Nature appears to them in dreams in the form of an old woman or some such figure and shows them the way. I have seen several such dreams in cases of young people who are uncertain whether to study natural science, for instance, medicine or something else. You can thus actually prove by the material of modern people 
that the drive towards interest in the material aspect of outer nature very often springs from the constellation of this archetype, which is the dynamism behind natural science. If the biblical story evaluates this imparting of knowledge to man as a catastrophe or as unlucky, that certainly can be compared to the fact that natural science, including mathematics, has tended from the very beginning to possess people in an autonomous way, to possess their interest in a totalistic way to such an extent as to give them a demonic drive, upsetting not only their personal balance, but also to some extent, the balance of civilization. The successive drive of natural science and its destructive aspects is nowadays such a banality that I do not need to enlarge upon it, but it springs from the fact that one archetype is, as it were, moving out of the general instinctual order. Therefore, you can say that the myth of the original natural science is partly the myth of an instinctual dissociation Homo Faber is already dissociated or, in, or is a dangerous, I think that must be Homo Father, God the Father, Man the Father, is already disso dissociated or is a dangerous way estranged from its natural instinctive roots. That is what the biblical myth says. While this Isis myth, on the contrary, lauds the same event as an enormous progress. If there are two myths, one of which is more or less the opposite of the other, or the same thing with a different evaluation, we can only conclude that there is basic uncertainty in the human being. And even in his consciousness, the problem is real and not invented, and we have to look at it from both angles. The angel bears on his head a vessel not caulked with pitch and which contains shining water. This absolutely transparent or clean water, the Greek text says, is in alchemy the symbol of the mysterious basic matter par excellence. The idea of the eternal water is, as you know from Jung's innumerable amplifications and associations from other texts, one of the very greatest alchemical symbols. It is, the dream, it is the divine water, which is naturally not H2O, but is actually a symbol for the most basic matter of the world, the prima materia. So in this image, it is said that the angel bears the mystery of the basic material of the cosmos, we would say. And that is exactly what these alchemists, just like modern physicists, had in mind that, possi uh, that possibly all material phenomena went back to one basic material, the search for which was their great fascination. For with it goes the feeling that it, it was the basic material. Uh, could, uh, for with it came the feeling that if this basic material could be discovered, one would, in a way, look into the divine fabric of the cosmos. And of course, now we know that the original material was hydrogen. Uh, I'll now share another of these images. Okay, so here it is. I'm assuming you're hearing me. I uh, haven't. So I should do that, pull the chat out so I can make sure that uh, I'm not talking to myself here. <laughs> and uh, good, good morning, Justin. I've decided that I'll do my best to join you for the four days in Montana, contacting the embassy to, to see if I'm still on or can you get off the no-fly list. Well, good, I appreciate that, Justin. I think that'll be a worthwhile endeavor. Okay, so we're looking at uh, figure 15 of this book. Uh, and 
Uh, let's see, I, I guess I need to share it. Oh, I am, no, there. <laughs> um, there is figure 15. The alchemist and his assistant make the sign of the secret in accordance with the experience that much of what happens is a relationship between two people cannot be shared with others. Okay, that's an interesting point. All right, so reading on, Isis insists on getting the secret after which the text continues with the oath by which Horus is conjured not to disclose it. This accords with the style of the mystery and late religious initiations in general. In the Hellenistic world, it is an emphasis which shows that now the great thing has been imparted. Therefore, Isis's son, Horus, has to realize that the secret is for him only and nobody else, and that he must never talk about it. We have in the oldest text something which we shall meet again and again throughout the history of alchemy, namely the motif of the great secret, which cannot be just scientifically told and imparted from one individual to another. In the history of alchemy and chemistry, this has always been regarded as a trick to make the whole thing appear important and mysterious and to veil secrets. Naturally, there is a certain amount of truth in that, because as you know, at this time, alchemy was also chemistry, and therefore knowledge as to how to make alloys, etc., was a trade secret for the very banal financial reason of keeping the upper hand. In our modern industries, the same thing goes on. There is even a system for spying out the secrets of industrial management and metallurgy. For such knowledge means power and money, as it did in olden times. If, for instance, you make an alloy which looked like gold, thanks for, to the very indifferent police control at the time, false money could be made and a fortune quickly acquired, so that naturally the secret would only be imparted to one's best friends. But this banal aspect does not explain the whole phenomenon. Consider what happens in an analytical situation. Perhaps you all have experienced that certain things can only be said or explained or done with one other person. And generally, if an analysis goes deep enough, there comes a point where analysts and analysand share the secret which both know could not be shared with anybody else and which therefore establishes a unique relationship. This is experienced by people in the surroundings exactly in the same way as was felt about alchemy, namely that there must be something dirty connected with it for otherwise it could be spoken of straight out, but it is quite impossible to say and do certain things except with one person. That is the uniqueness and exclusiveness of every real human relationship and of every real meeting with the unconscious. That is why it is so difficult and in a way misleading to report on case material for certain things come up which cannot be told, not for reasons of discretion or because they have to do with sex or concern a divorce or marriage or something to do with finances or some kind of indiscreet dirt, which people always think of in this case, but because the thing is ineffable. Sometimes the relationship or analysis goes on in half said words, which are understood in a specific way by the other person, but which you cannot repeat when speaking of the case. You can tell the dreams and repeat what you told the analysand about their meaning, but you know perfectly well that you are telling only half the story. There are also things which cannot be told because they happen without your knowing. Somebody may say later, I don't remember what you said at the time, but you laughed in a certain way which suggested something to me. That can happen without either party noticing at the time and such effects cannot be helped and cannot be spoken of, though in actual fact, they may form the basis of the analytical and therapeutic process. 
there is also the sympathy between two people, the sympathia, which means that they suffer together, the two are impressed together, and this condition of togetherness, which comes from participating in the same experience cannot be explained, nor not because one wants to make a secret of it, but because it is inexplicable, irrational, and very complex. So you can say that in every process of analysis, there is a secret, and generally one cannot talk about it. If, therefore, you report a case, you only report it in part. It is a unique thing, but usually people go home and think now they know how the process of individuation works. And then they completely off the track. And then they are completely off the track because their process of individuation could be guaranteed to go quite differently per definitionum. It is an individuation, which means something unique. Therefore, it is even misleading to recount a unique case for involuntarily people generalize about it, thinking that they uh, now understand how therapy is conducted, but they are already barking up the wrong tree. There is a real secret for as soon as you touch the uniqueness of the process or of the individual, it cannot be talked about anymore. Often when asked to speak on case material, when looking through my cases, I think that it would be wrong to give any of them. Generally, one can only speak of slight cases or of those which go wrong, which is humility, humiliating to one's vanity. But at least such a case can be talked about. Remark, isn't Isis referring to something like that when she says, you are me and I am you, after which there is nothing more to be said. Dr. Um, France, yes, exactly. That is what I am driving at. There is the I am you and you are me in it. And that is the element which cannot be told. That is the unio mystica, the thing that happens at the bottom of what they try to push off with the word transference, thus making it a technical thing. But it is a real mystery a mystical experience, one which therefore can never be imparted or shared with another person. And uh, our followers will remember that um, when I wanted Tim Holmes to paint my portrait, I insisted on uh, going to Montana for at least one day uh, to be in his presence uh, for a day before he began to paint. Isis swears first in the name of Hermes, which is probably the Greek translation for to Toth, <coughs> the moon god, an ape god, then in the name of Anubis, which has not been translated and therefore is recognizable in its Egyptian form, and also in the name Kerkoros, the howling of Kerkoros, referring to the howling of the, the dog, Kerberos. In the parallel text, the name is Kerberos. Kerberos is the snake which eats its own tail. So it must refer to the dog-like demon, which has been confused with the snake and here is described as the snake and the guardian of the underworld. So this is a mixture of the figure of Kerberos, therefore Ker in the first syllable with certain guardian figures of the Egyptian underworld among which we very often find the snake which eats its own tail. I will now read the text which speaks of the Ouroboros snake as depicted in certain Egyptian tombs. In the tomb of Seti I, for instance, there is a drawing of a house with two sphinxes outside, uh, which is a kind of schematic representation of the underworld where the resurrection of the sun god takes place. Just before his resurrection, the sun god is represented 
as an ichthyophallic man lying on his back with erect phallus and around him is the snake which eats its own tail. The inscription merely says, this is the corpse. You see therefore that in the underworld when the sun God has reached the moment when death and resurrection meet, when he is in his tomb at the depth of the underworld, he is represented as, a, as surrounded by this snake. According to the Egyptian text, the snake which eats its own tail is considered to be the guardian of the underworld. And it's probably this snake which is invoked here. Now there's an additional image here, which I'll share with you. Okay, this is uh, image 16, the Ouroboros, the snake that eats its own tail is crowned dragon and as winged and wingless serpents compare winged and wing wingless birds on page 124. Well, we haven't gotten to 124 yet, but uh, you will see it shortly. <clears throat> okay. The text continues, I conjure you also in the name of the ferryman Asheron and later go to the peasant Asherontos and he will tell you the whole secret. One thinks first naturally of the Greek underworld stream Acheron, but since obviously the translation represents Egyptian ideas and images, we have to see what underworld godhead or figure might have given rise to such a name. In this connection, I have found some uh, very interesting amplifications. There is an Egyptian god or concept called Akar, or sometimes Akara. Akaro. This god is represented by two lions. I'm going to give you another image now. Okay. This god is represented by two lions sitting back to back with sometimes the disc of the sun between their two backs. That is called Ruti, or the double lion, and that is how the god, or the word Akar, is represented. He is shown as the double lion, or the double dog, or as yesterday and tomorrow, because in Egyptian mythology, this whole picture represents the moment of the resurrection of the sun god. Yesterday he was dead, tomorrow he will be alive again. Midnight, when the sun is at its lowest point and begins to rise again, is the turning point from death to life, from yesterday to the next day. This lowest moment of the Anantiodromian of the resurrecting uh, resurrection is Akar, for Akar means that moment. In this late, in these late languages and in primitive old languages, Akar means not only the moment but also the place and situation and the situation of death and resurrection of yesterday and tomorrow of the resurrection and regeneration of the sun God. Sometimes Akra is not represented as this deepest point of the underworld, but as the door of the beyond to which the double lions are the doorkeepers. There, so there is an admixture of two ideas. It is the entrance of the beyond, the limen, or the deepest point in the underworld itself, in the tombs of Tutmosis three and Amenophis two. There is the same scene as in the tomb of Seti the first. Okay, and then this image comes up, figure seventeen, Riti, Riti. I don't know how you'd say that. The Egyptian double lion with the disc of the sun representing Akar, the moment when the sun reappears after its journey through the underworld, i.e. the rebirth of consciousness after the night sea journey. <clears throat> I will now read some of the invocations in the book of the caverns, one of the books of the dead in the many Egyptian variations, the sun god when in the underworld 
says, O Akar, I went your way. You whose forms are mysterious, open thy arms before me. Here I am, those are within you to call. When he says, those are within you to call me, Akar is simply the whole underworld, the space in the underworld. And those who are in the underworld are the spirits of the dead and the God of the dead. And the spirits call the sun god when he plunges into the underworld. The text continues, I have seen thy mysteries, my sun, disc, and geb, the earth god, are those whom I carry on my back. <clears throat> Chepera is now inside his envelope. Chepera is the resurrecting form of the sun god and who is now as in the egg. He is the envelope and next moment will appear over the horizon. Open thy arms, receive me, here I am. I will chase away your darkness. In the tomb of Ramses the fourth, or the sixth, I'm sorry. In the tomb of Ramses the sixth, Acker is depicted by the two lions and beneath them are the words, quote, see what this God looks like, Geb, the earth God, and Shepherah, the scarab. Watch the images which are within him. Unquote. So Akar is a space which contains the dead or the images of everything which exists. He is not only the double lion or the door of, to the beyond, but that mysterious space in the underworld in which are the dead people and the images. He watches them and has them in his arms. This great God stays below in the underworld and speaks with the great image that carries his corpse. Akar is the great image which carries the corpse or body of the sun god, as can be understood from the drawing. The sun god sheds light on everything lying in the arms of Akar, which brings about the reunion of the bones of the god. He recollects, recollects, he recollects, but said as recollects, the scattered bones of the corpse. One of the great motifs of the Book of the Dead in Egypt is that the dead is dismembered, as was Osiris, and must therefore be reassembled before they can re resurrect. They must be put together again so as to be able to rise from the underworld. Akar is the agent of recollecting the bones and members of the god. Another representation found in the tomb of Ramses the sixth is the double lion standing between the primordial waters. Underneath the description is Akar, or the inscription is Akar, and then an eclipse, which in this connection symbolizes the underworld or the world of the dead. And the inscription says that Akar and Shu, the air god, are the two, are the two creators of the world. Thus you see that Akar is not only the agent in the resurrection of the sun god and the whole underworld, but also one of the agencies in the creation of the world. Sometimes the double lion, sometimes the double lions are replaced, as mentioned above, by two of Anubis's jackals, two dog-like animals. And then the inscription below is, quote, these are the openers of the way, the agents of resurrection. Close quote. I think, I think, therefore, it would be not too far-fetched to conjecture that Acharan or Acharantos alludes to this Egyptian god, for as you know, the main content of the great secret impart, imparted by Isis to Horus is that, the, that a lion generates a lion, barley generates barley, wheat generates wheat, and so on. Therefore, a man is only generated in the same way, and it is also especially said, a dog, a dog. So then there's uh, another image here. So 
So what, uh, and so the image is Osiris with wheat or corn sprouting from his body, the text. So what if at first seems a completely banal statement of nature, namely the secret of sexual gen generation and of the germs and plant generation reveals itself as having in the late antique Greek and Egyptian of that time, a completely other net of associations. These images were all connected or associated with the idea of the resurrection of the dead, of the recreation of the sun god and of the recreation of the world. That is the secret illusion in the text. As you know, the resurrection of Osiris has very often been represented by the simile though it is more than a simile of the resurrection of the corn in late antiquity, for instance, in many Egyptian towns, there were rituals during which a pine tree was cut down and hollowed out, representing the body of Isis or the coffin. The coffin is the mother goddess, as you know. Uh, wheat or barley or corn was then put in and watered and the grain sprouted when put in the sun <clears throat> and so represented a spiritual ritual of resurrection. In the museum in Cairo, this corn mummy can still be seen in a kind of flat box with sand in it. Corn was sown in the form of Os Osiris's mummy. It was sprinkled with water, sprouted and then withered such things were known as Osiris's gardens and represented the resurrection of the dead. The process was repeated at every classical Egyptian funeral. Corn was placed inside the bands of the mummy of the corpse and sprinkled with water. And when the corn began to sprout, that was a sign that the dead had now resurrected. In this typical primitive and magic form of all these rituals were performed completely literally on the mummy of the corpse. So the process of the death of the corn in the earth and its resurrection as wheat or barley was closely connected to the minds of the people with the idea of the resurrection, first of the god Osiris and later of every human being. Um, so now I'm going to give you another image or set of images. This is uh, Anubis anointing the mummy of Osiris with I Isis giving directions in the top and uh, the resurrection of Osiris attended by Nephthys and Isis is the bottom scene. Now, what on earth has this to do with alchemy? Clearly, it seems to refer to certain late antique mysteries of the dead in the Hellenistic Egyptian world. And we can recognize the connection with the famous archetypal mystery of the death and resurrection of the young spring God. But why does that come as the essential explanation of the whole alchemical mystery? And why on earth in the text I read you last time, after this explanation, are there such completely banal recipes? I think in order to understand what these people had in mind, one must first of all be extremely naive and follow a naive thought. Let us assume that you think of your own resurrection if you hope for one, even though you may not believe in it. Naturally, the first thing that occurs to you is the corpse and what happens to it. The worms eat it or in the crematorium, it is burnt to ashes. If we are naive and honest, we cannot detach our minds from the immediate sight of what remains of us after death. And therefore in all human civilizations, the corpse is treated with great care and all kinds of rituals because it represents a mystery. The form of the human being who lived is still there but something is lacking or has changed. Naive feeling uh, still makes, still takes what lies before you as your father or your friend or whoever it may be. And if not, what is it? If you hope for resurrection, 
you think that if there is such a thing, then the body which has disintegrated must somehow be put together again. If you continue to follow that thought naively, you will think that if one knew the basic matter from which the whole complex phenomenon of the human body is built up, then it could be remade. Don't imagine I am preaching that to you as, don't, <clears throat> sorry. Don't imagine I am preaching that to you as something true. I only want to show you that it would be an idea likely to occur to a naive mind and in trying to discuss the problem of resurrection with people. I often, I have often seen that they do, they do think along these lines, they speak of the glorified body, but they might, there might be a basic matter or substance. We do not know what matter is. So from that basis, which we do not know, and which is God's own secret, why should we, why should he not remake the whole body again? That is a common belief among many Christians who have not thought too deeply, but who, in the effort to understand, have a general idea of the resurrection of the body. And I think that similar naive thoughts were behind these texts, namely that the problem of resurrection is somehow linked to the problem of what matter is and what it, if it has a basic form, it can be transformed. Now, if you, now if there is a basic matter which can be tr transformed into something else, then the basic matter is immortal and can never be dissolved. That is even the idea of the atom, that which cannot be split further. Uh, that is the most basic particle or matter material, which is what the word means. It also means the individual, the last unit. It cannot be, a, be split or disintegrate and is therefore immortal. So there, uh, so there one touches an eternal thing. And if one gets to the bottom of the thing, if one gets to the bottom of that, then one has a secret resurrection and of immortality and of how God made the world. I beg your pardon, let me read that a little bit more clearly. So it cannot be split or disintegrated and is therefore immortal. So there, there one touches an eternal thing and it is, if one gets to the bottom of that, then one has the secret of resurrection and of our immortality and of how God made the world. That was the trend of thought and the reflection behind the ideas contained in this text, which accounts for the investigation into the basic composition of cosmic matter that the problem of the resurrection of the dead was for these people bound up with such thoughts shows that the hope for immortality, the whole tremendous emotional drive man feels in his own longing for immortality, went at that time into alchemy, which explains how the imagery of the process of individuation got projected into this problem. So far, I have only asserted and amplified the above with a few Egyptian texts, but afterwards I am going to read you a completely different fifth century text from which you can see that the, such thoughts really existed. Up to now, they have only been alluded to so that we have to reconstruct from other texts. Okay, now I'm gonna stop there for two reasons. One is that my voice often gives out after reading for an hour. Uh, and also uh, because I have a advanced reading group um, class in uh, 45 minutes. Uh, but one thing I <clears throat> do want to say is that I sort of had an experience of this at the time of the death of my father and by synchronicity. Um, I had 
already spoken to the doctor uh, and in effect uh, told him that he could let my father go. Uh, this is after it was clear that he was going to be dead in the next 24 hours, let's say. And I, as the eldest or the patriarch of the family, I was called upon to make this decision and to release the doctor <clears throat> so that he didn't have to use other heroic methods to keep my father alive another 12 hours or whatever it would have been. And um, so uh, we said to, goodbye to my father in the hospital. And uh, we went home to our family uh, home where we were eating a sushi dinner, which my father loved sushi and uh, everyone in my family loves sushi. So we were having sushi dinner by synchronicity when the call came in on my cell phone that my father had passed away. And the hospital asked whether we wanted to come in and to see his dead body. And I simply had, uh, responded very um, instinctively uh, no, that won't be necessary. He's with us now. And I think that that is true. And my feelings about my father and what I know of his life, et cetera, haven't changed a whit from that time. And um, so that, that is the encouragement. The resurrection happens within us. And I hope that's helpful to you. Uh, now I will quickly look at the chat, see if there's anything. Yep. And funny, I was looking for a book yesterday and found this book. I bought it, but forgot they are my prepping books for something in the future, yes. That should be true. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me today. Uh, tomorrow, uh, or even later this evening, I'll try to read the second part of chapter three. It's quite a long chat, quite a long lecture. It's referred to as a chapter, but it's a lecture by Marie-Louise von Franz. Um, thank you for being here today.